allowing someone to join in. So hey, people here and people out there. So today we have the honor of receiving and hosting actually, you know, a, a pioneer, not only within the indigenous family, but you know, in commerce, constitutional law, and as well genetics. So, you know, without further ado, we have brother Toriano Obashango L, aka the chief, you know, so <laughs> <laughs> from the Olmec, from the Urkansu, right? Urkansu. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, Peace and love, bro, everybody. Yeah. So, yes, yo, sir. bro, man, you're just going to start, dude. And what I like to do, and it's for people hearing you, and that's going to hearing you, you know, who's a Bashan? Mm -hmm. you know? So, we're mm -hmm. going to go back a little further back and you know, what's your pedigree and where you coming from, man? You know what I'm saying? So some of us know, you know, it's from Arkansas, you know, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. tell us, tell us like a little more, more, you know what I mean? Right. Okay. Well, uh, my folks have been in, in the South, man, for generations, man. Uh, the states that we pretty much hail from, uh, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, Louisiana, Texas, uh, Arkansas, Tennessee, and uh, the various tribal lineages that are running in my bloodline, my pedigree is uh, Chata, uh, Chicksa, Chikasha, Washashaktun, uh, Washita, Washita, Anianwia, uh, which they meant no more as Cherokee. Uh, and uh, uh, Nadine, also Apache. So those are the lineages of my background. Uh, I was raised by, well, I had both my parents in my life, my mother and my father. But uh, being uh, born in the 70s, in the 70s, 1970, both my parents worked. So hmm. they left me with uh, Big Mama, Great Granny. And Great Granny was pri very primary, uh, in my upbringing, my raising, as well as her mother too, before she died. So, uh, these were very strong matriarchal women. Uh, you know, I come from a, a good solid stock of men and women as far as traditional values, upbringing, things of that nature and knowing who you are in relation to, uh, your lineage upon this land. So my great grandmother, Odessa Yancey. She was born in 1911. Oh, sorry, bro. It's on mute, though. Great great grandmother, Eliza Gibson. Johnson Gibson. She was born in 1880. So, uh, like I said, they were the primary factors, you know, as a child growing mm -hmm. up, telling me who I was in relation to the land. So, as I got older, uh, you know, I had other elders like my father. He was very, he's very, well, growing up, he's very instrumental, you know, in knowledge of self, uh, knowing who I am. And as I got older, I started to do my own due diligence and various other things. We're talking about like in the eighties now, you know, 1980s and, uh, throughout the nineties. So that's pretty much, uh, my background, uh, as far as, who I am, what I am, uh, when I learned about the Moorish paradigm, uh, it was around about the late 90s. I didn't know very much about it, just touch and go. Uh, read a book by York, uh, Malachi York, set the record straight. But it really didn't go into too much detail until I started doing my own due diligence in the early to mid 2000s, around about 2006, 2007. And uh, when I went down to the Dominican Republic, which you know that story, uh, when I was down there yeah, and what the, uh, the young sister told me. Yeah, but some of us mm -hmm. know it, but- Hold on one second, man. Yeah, yeah no, no worries, man. Knocked out my- Okay, so we'll wait for you, no worries. Yeah, so- Can you hear me? No, I was good. Okay, I don't know what happened. Okay, so we got you. It's all good. Uh, 
Can you hear me, Chief? Yeah, I hear you, but I, I had you where you was coming through on the uh okay on uh the big speakers. Okay. And uh, so I'm gonna knock it out. So just one second. Let me go in here. Yeah, no worries, man. Okay. Okay. All right. Go ahead, say something. Let me see. Yeah, so Chief, I may know it, some of us may know it when you went actually uh, you know, through the island of Ayati. And I just want to mm -hmm. put a shout out there to Benjamin Tiprit, aka uh -huh. Margo Washita, because he's the one that, you know, put me, uh, liked the island, used to be called Kayati, in which mm -hmm. Ayati is a derivation. But, you know, you went on mm -hmm. the eastern part of the island, and uh, some of us know it, but some of us don't know it, man. So you went, you know, Dominican Republic in front of Mystery School. So yeah. probably not a lot of people knows, you know, that yeah. part of yourself, you know what I'm saying? So could right. you touch on that mystery school training that you did over there? Yeah. It was uh, 21 divisions uh, while I was down there and uh, I was uh, going through the system, you know, to uh, basically uh, immerse myself deeper in my studies of, uh, you know, our sciences. And I had already had a background in it, you know, for a number of years at the time, since like the late nineties. Uh, and what made me want to get even deeper into it was because on my mother's, uh, mother's side of the family, uh, my great, great grandmother's husband, my great, great grandfather, he was a root man. That's what we call him down South. Uh, uh, he worked, he worked with voodoo. So, you know, dealing with the spirits and all of that type of stuff. So it was already in my background, in my blood. Yeah. And I just wanted to, uh, you know, the opportunity came, it presented itself and, and how it actually happened, man, it was uh, very, very mystical and supernatural. In 2004, mm -hmm. uh, after I'd, you know, been heavily into doing the work, uh, I was paid a visit by uh, Kawo, or Disha Shango. And he had told me, Arisha had told me that I would be going to Dominican Republic to get initiated. Now, mind you, in 2004, I didn't have a passport. I didn't know anybody in the Dominican Republic. Mm. And so, you know, <laughs> the, uh, the, 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 the human side of, of me, or I, should I say the ego side was like, you know, well, even though Baba Shango had revealed to me that's where I'm going to get initiated. And I was like, man, I ain't got no money to get down there. I ain't got no passport and I don't know anybody. So I started trying to make plans to go to South Carolina or Yotunji. And every time uh, I had the money to go to South Carolina, something came up that prevented the trip. I tried it like three times, man. For real? And every time something came up that thwarted the trip, so I couldn't go. So after the third time, I said, okay, Baba, you know, you spoke. I guess it's what it is. How I'm gonna get down there, I don't know. And so uh, in 2006, I had a uh, move back to Atlanta and uh, I was working on music, doing music. And it just so happened that I ended up uh, meeting this young lady and we started talking and we started dating. She was from the Dominican Republic and her mother, <laughs> her mother invited me to uh, go because she saw my picture on uh, MySpace at the time. And she was like, that boy, he has something with him. She, and she was like, you can look at his eyes. The Arisha is really with him. The spirit is really with him. So uh, Madre, that's what I call her, man. I love her to this day because she's like a mother to me. She said, how would you like to go to my country? And I said, well, where's that Madre? She said, Dominican Republic. And that's how it happened, man. It didn't cost a dime. I didn't have to pay for anything, nothing. It was like everything was already prepared, you know, on the higher level. Yeah. And three years, you know, when I had received the revelation from Baba, and it was September of 2004 that I was gonna go. 
in May of 2007, I was down there. It just happened just like that, you know? So, you know, uh, it just showed me, man, the power of, 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 of when, you, when you build that close connection with the ancestors and, and you know, Orisha or, or the Lua, whoever you, you know, whichever ones you work with, I deal with both. Uh, how if you follow spirit, things is already laid out for you. You don't have to struggle. Whereas if you try to be hard head after they tell you something, then things will start happening. <laughs> right. <laughs> That'll mess it up. So your way ain't your way ain't the way. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and uh, you know, when you're dealing with the mystery systems, man, the thing about it is you gotta be pure at heart. You know, it's as as you gotta have your heart as clean as possible because you're dealing with a lot of power and a lot of energy. And a lot of people don't know that when you step off into that realm, if you go into that realm specifically looking for power, eventually it'll consume and destroy you. You destroy yourself. You follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But if you go in as balanced as possible with a clean heart, then you become one with the cosmos where basically you are a conduit. You know, you flow, you flow with the grain instead of going against the grain and trying to do your own thing. And that's, one thing I'll say is a lot of our people here, and I, I sit back and I see it you on know, social media all the time. You know, I sit and I watch these people talk and I hear them talking blah, 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 about this, that, and the third. And I can tell right right there by looking at them how they are. They ain't got it. They ain't got it. You know, they doing a lot of talking, but the spirit ain't really ain't really working with them like that. Eventually, they'll destroy themselves. So right. yeah, you, you got to go in with a clean heart, man, and balanced hands. That's right. That's right. And you know what? Um... So right off from there, I just want to put the link or like, you know, connection. So that your proper experience, you know what I'm saying? In the mm -hmm. island, yeah, a major boost for later on with the uh, massive work that you did. Yeah, I would definitely say that. And I'm gonna tell you something, man. When I was down there, I was in uh, Barona. You know what that is, right? Say that again? Barahona. Barahona. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's where I was. Okay. And uh, we were staying with uh, Doña Gladys. I call her uh, 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 Mama Gladys. Mama and Gladys. this was my madrina's sister. So uh, Mama, uh, my madrina was Mama Luisa, her sister. That was the one that had initiated me. So I wasn't down there looking for anything dealing with Moors, you know. Uh, I was just down there getting initiated so I could do this work. But the thing about it is, it's like, uh, I was sitting outside one day, man, and it was just beautiful, man. It's like paradise. Probably maybe it was about 80, 85 degrees. The sky was blue. The wind was blowing. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the, 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 the ocean was probably maybe about a half a mile walk to maybe three quarters of a mile walk from where we stayed in town. So Mama Gladys' uh, granddaughter, Kathleen, had come home from school. And uh, I would just sit down on the, on, the, on the porch, eating the orange, and uh, just enjoying the weather. And uh, Kathleen had said, uh, you know, she spoke, uh, uh, hola, Toriano. She said, uh, you know, how you doing? I said, Ben, Ben, how you doing, Catherine? She said, I'm doing fine. I said, what you doing? I said, man, sitting out here enjoying the weather, you know? And uh, she said, okay, I'm gonna go inside and put my books up and uh, I'm gonna come outside and uh, and eat with you. So she went in the house and she put her books up. She came outside with the orange. So we was talking and stuff. And she said, uh, you wanna know what I learned in school today? And I said, well, what's that, Catherine? She said, well, the day my teacher told me that the Moors are the original people of the Americas and that they own the land and that Atlantis is real. And man, when she said that, you know, my mouth, it just fell on the ground. I was like, you know, wow. And so uh, when it came time to come back, uh, I don't know if uh, well, probably most of your audience, they from the island. But uh, me, you know, going down there the first time and coming back, I could tell that 
there was energy being worked on this land and what we call North America. And it wasn't a good energy. Somebody was literally putting things into the ethers that's keeping this place chaotic. Mm. And you could feel it so strong that uh, the moment when I had landed, going down there and my feet touched that soil, it felt like, man, I had a, a 10 pound blanket mm. or a hundred pound weight just lift off my back. Word. I never felt so free, you know? And when I knew I had to come back, you know, I started dreading it because I, I just said, something is not right here, man, you could tell. And when I landed back, you could tell that energy was, was thick, man, you know? So as I started uh, doing my due diligence, when I got back from what, uh, like I said, I'd already been dealing with the occult for many years. Right. Uh, I started looking into what she told me about Moors. Because mind you, I didn't hear anything about Moors growing up from uh, Grandma Modessi Yancey, Great Grandma Modessi Yancey, or Great Great Grandma Liza. Mm -hmm. So uh, the first place I went uh, to, I ended up, you know, uh, through a friend, was uh, Moore Science Temple in downtown Atlanta. And uh, I started asking questions, you know, how are Moors Indians, you know? I said, because I knew it wasn't a coincidence that I heard that in the Dominican Republic, right. you know? Yeah. So I started trying to see where is the connection, okay? Uh, the uh, grand governor, he, he broke it down somewhat, you know, but I was still searching. I still wasn't convinced yet, you know, although I had taken on L, the title of L at that time. Uh, when I went down to, uh, I left Atlanta in the summer of 2008 and uh, moved to Texas. And on the way, we had stopped at uh, Richwood, Louisiana. That's where the Empress was from, Empress Verdias. And we sat a while and uh, talked to uh, one of her very, very, very close friends, uh, Miss Emma Pitts, may she rest in peace. And the thing about it is, as I was sitting up there talking to the elder man, she knew my family, she knew my mother's uh, father's side of the family and knew him very well. And we're talking about probably like in the early 1900s, mm -hmm. this woman was rattling down history, calling out names. And I was like, dang, you know where I knew that? Okay, then, yeah, you know my people then. And uh, we went off into the history of the Washita when we were talking about my great uh, grandmother, uh, they called us sweet black Creole mama Fanny Crittenden. Very dark skin, with very, very, very long uh, silky hair. And then she was talking about, oh man, hey, I know Fanny, man. Fanny, very beautiful woman, man. Very pretty. You know, when she was younger, blase this, blase that. She said, I know your people. She said, I know Nelson. She said, yeah, y'all Cherokee. I said, dang, okay, yeah, you really know our history then. Yeah. So, uh, after that, we continued on our journey to Texas. And uh, uh, I ended up moving back to, I got some knowledge when I was in Texas. I stayed there from like the beginning of July to almost the end of November. And I ran into some uh, some brothers there uh, who was on the Moorish thing. And they was able to give me even more history uh, than I received in Atlanta. And uh, when I finally moved, when it finally came time to move, when I moved back up here to Arkansas, it was uh, it was on after that, man. I was hungry. I wanted to know more. You know, I already knew that we was the uh, the Aboriginal peoples of the land. I learned that back in 1974. You know, from Great Grandma Modessi Yance and Great Great Grandma Liza. This I already knew, but I wanted to find out more about this more uh, an, an Indian connection, and then uh. I start coming across things like uh, Carthaginians settling over here and uh, uh, the uh, the Phoenicians and uh, Mansa Khan Khan Musa, you know, things I'd heard bits and pieces about, but the history of, you know, over my years, it wasn't going in in depth as I was finding around about 2009, 2010. Mm. And, uh, 
uh, the uh, the early Moroccans coming over here long before Islam had even touched what we call Morocco over there. You had the monastic brotherhood of Morocco coming over here. So once I started finding out all that stuff, I started looking for landmarks. And then I ran into the Bornstone, Anubis Caves, uh, 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 the uh, Crawford County, uh, 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 Crawford County Rock Shelter with these ancient uh, uh, epi uh, pictographs and epigraphical writing, things of that nature. And so I started compiling all of this stuff and I started putting two and two together, man, to say, okay, then uh, there is a birthright here. Now, how do we get into the meat and potatoes of it? You know, yeah. what's really, what really belongs to us. And uh, that pretty much led to uh, learning how to draft and write things in accordance with law and I started exercising it, you know so that's pretty much uh pretty much in a roundabout way how how it went down so good man so yo chief there's another thing too um a lot of people from the indigenous family mm -hmm. unfortunately are still stuck with you know Indian you know what I'm saying right. yeah, let's get not people wrong, you and I are both, you know what I'm saying, indigenous people, you know, yeah. belong to the uh, Palo American. So could you yeah. touch on the fact that, you know, that okay. we're Indian and, you know, with the, the mess up part regarding Yeah. That. Well, the, the thing about it is when I started doing my homework on that word, uh, the good thing about it that helped me was uh, I was private school educated. My mom and, you know, uh, made sure that me and my sister, man, you know, she wanted the top education that uh that we that we could uh have. So you know, we was private school educated, and one of the things that helped me dealing with a lot of the uh, the things that really the foundational documents that really put us in the trick bag uh, was that I took Latin for two years. I took Latin for two years and also took Greek. So. Uh, when I started going back and looking at these documents and seeing what the Pope had written down, uh, and of course we all know if you if you know Latin, you know what's called Romance languages, and Spanish is a Romance language, uh, French is a Romance language, mm -hmm. Italian is a Romance language, Romanian is a Romance language, mm -hmm. a lot of English. Uh, have Latin uh, origins as far as words. Uh, so when I started looking at what the Pope was saying and how things will have a, a vowel or a consonant shift, even though uh, when I say Romance language, that means it has its origins, you already know, but for those that don't know, it has its origins in the language of what they call the Roman Empire, which that's not originally their language. Latin was already spoken early by the Etruscans. But not only that, <clears throat> it has its uh, it has a, a foundational origin with what they call Sanskrit, which is you know the language of uh, Bharat Paro, or what they call Hindustan. So when I start when the when the Pope wrote wrote in the uh, uh, I want to say it was the Dumb Diverses, and he said, uh, sine, di sine Dios. Sine is without Dios is God. And when you go to the Spanish, and uh, I saw uh, what they call Los Indios. Well, that's actually, that's, that's the compounding of, uh, of like a preposition and a noun. Sendios is sine dios and los. And when you look at it as los, los sendios, it's actually, and you can type it up, it'll tell you the godless or those who don't have a god. Right. And if, if you know about the, uh, the doctrine of discovery, there's a case, Johnson versus McIntosh of 1823, that uh, they actually uh, referenced the doctrine of discovery in that case. 
And that's when they said uh, <laughs> Indians only have the right of occupancy. They don't even have the, uh, the title to their land. Hmm. So uh, that was a big, uh, a big eye opener as to why, you know, uh, things went the way they did when they, uh, when the, when the Spanish and the conquistadors and the English and all of them came over here, you know, they was literally moving on that doctrine of discovery. Yep. And so, uh, a lot of people try to say, well, the Moors brought them over here and, and I, I've heard it all, man. <laughs> I've heard it. If anybody read the Kraken, they'll know that's a well-researched document. I've heard it all, man, with these with these various people who, who more bash and more hate. And when I go and I get, if, if you go into OneDrive, which you've already been to, the anthropological, archaeological folder, I got all these old pictures and documents where the Dutch uh, and the English and uh, even the Spanish are calling Indians Moors. They're calling them Moors, it's written there. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah, so we can't, even, we can't even argue that. I yeah. mean, it's right there, you know, and these people, they want to try to put you on trial for something that was written 400, 500 years ago. Come on, man. You got to go to the source of the information. And that person is dead. So in law, that's what you call ancient documents. You can't even argue it. An ancient document means one that has been seasoned and vetted throughout time. Thanks. So uh, the only thing... Uh, when I started looking to the colonial laws, uh, the only thing that I that I did see was they referenced Moors, but the Moors could pretty much man move throughout society as they pleased. They had no problems, you know. And it's like what they did was they 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 they, they had two boxes out there, and basically they said pick a box. If you pick this box, this is what comes with it. We're not gonna tell you what comes with it. You're just gonna have to find out. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Right. And those people that picked that box of Indian, well, look at them now. Even though you have a uh, quote unquote, the $5 Indian, which are the Europeans who, you know, move themselves underneath that title by paying a fee, but their blood doesn't link back to the indigenous peoples of the land. A lot of them don't. Yeah. Uh, they're, 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 uh, they're on concentration camps. That's all the reservation is, you know? And they pretty much, man, are in such an impoverished condition, you know, and it's all based on of classification, you know, and codification of the classification, which means that Basically, this is what you're saying you are, so this is what's going to happen, you know. Now, another eye-opener was for me was when I read uh, Empress Bertiasi's book, and I've talked to her son, Joe. You know, I've talked to Joe at least like on two separate occasions. When I read the book, I'm not going to get into that conversation. I was a little disappointed, you know. Uh, in my opinion, I, I feel like his mother's work should have been continued. But when I read her book, you know, Return of the Ancient Ones, yep. and the Mother Empress said that her, her great-grandmother who raised her, she was raised by her great-grandmother. Mm -hmm. Her great-grandmother said, we are remnants of ancient Moors. It's written right there in the book. Yeah, it is, man. Yeah. So as I started to look, you know, at this and going back to when I went to Richwood, uh, Louisiana and talked to Miss Pitts, who knew uh, Fanny, sweet black Creole mama Fanny Crittenden. And uh, she said, yes, yeah, your grandmother's a washerwoman. She was a washer talk, you know. And her stories had matched up to my mother's father's uh, sister, which was my auntie in St. Louis. We used to go visit her every summer. Mm -hmm. And she, she she knew her father's uh, tribal lineage, but she wasn't sure about her mother. She knew her mother was, well, you know, the old folks, they're going to say Indian. That's what, you know, you get the old folks a pass, <laughs> you know. But uh, 
when you get it straight from the horse's mouth and what it is in in in, in uh in historical context, uh Fanny was a moor. She was she was she was a mound builder, you know, she was a for Washington, Washita. So that's what made me go ahead looking at the law, looking at what they had done to the word Indian, looking at its origin, Sene Dios, Los Indios, uh, and looking at how they through classification and codification and also uh, stare diseases, because Johnson versus McIntosh is stare diseases. It's, <laughs> it don't look good, man. It's a, it's a bad rap, you know? So when I looked at the classification of coming from the Empress aspect, the Moors, you know, as well as the old history of the East coming over from here, you know, the monastic brotherhood, the empire and all of that, I said, okay, politically, politically and in law, this is the best choice for how you identify with these people. And I think that right there is the main point that a lot of people are missing because their whole system over there in the democracy, in the United States, they call it democracy, even though we know it's a republic, it's organically constitutionally established as a republic. But now they are operating in a maritime, admiralty, wartime capacity, practicing what's called mixed law. Uh, not mixed law, but mixed war. Mixed war. You can look that term up. Uh, they are now full-blown democracy. They even have it in several cases after 1940, staring diseases by the United States Supreme Court that they are a democracy, going full well against the Constitution, that everything on that side is about codification, classification and codification. So if you don't identify properly, man, you can really mess yourself up, you know? And I haven't had any problems, man, with these people, man, in regards to uh, how I identify, you know? And that's what a lot of these so-called black people that wanna be Indian have to understand because now it's gonna get even worse. You can just tell by looking at the system and with this blockchain and and, and, and uh, things that they're doing now in the digital age, codification and classification is gonna be part of the blockchain. So now you're talking about doing away with paper and going, uh, going globally where this information circulates around the world. So how you identify at point A is gonna be the same at point B, point C, point D, so on and so forth. And uh, you know, it's up to them. Everybody, everybody has a right to choose, you know, but you also have to, uh, accept the consequences of your choices. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I got you. Yeah. I got you. So, Hey, chief man, be before, uh, showing, you know, some of the landmarks, the connection and to shit Ronnie Bay, and your one drive, uh -huh. you're coming, you know, historically from your mystic pedigree, you know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. So could you give to the people your definition of more, but on a cosmic, you know what I'm saying? On a cosmic uh, approach. Uh -huh. uh, when I look at the word more, uh, and from my research of where all that, that word is, it's not just in Europe. Most people think it started in Europe. No, 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 no. You got to go back further than that. If you don't know about Moria, Morugan, Marian, and ancient Hindustan, Bharat Paro, then you're way off, you know. And not only that, uh, you have to understand about. Uh, uh, the Maru, uh, or the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Tamari, you know, in ancient Kemet, and they had the word more written in the hieroglyphs. They was known as the high priest of Anu, of the deity Anu. Uh, by the time it hit the, uh, the Europhonic languages, or what's attributed to Europe, France, German, and in, in, in English, Anglophonic, Francophonic. By the time it hit those, man, uh, the word was already well in use. 
from Hindustan all the way to Egypt, Kemen. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. Europeans didn't come up with that word. It became adopted in their uh, linguistics. And they got their linguistic system from us. Yeah. So, so uh, when you look at that word, because words hold power, their vibrations, their tones, frequencies, uh, acknowledging who you are, uh, it opens up uh, pathways and portals. A lot of people don't even understand the DNA. The DNA is, is, is a ladder. When you look at the spiral, the helix, it's actually a ladder. And inside your DNA is thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years of recorded history. So when you start dealing with uh, the titles of your people, whether they're the national title or whether they're the uh, the tribal title or ethnic title, Aniyanwia, Chata, Chiksa, Shikasha, Wushashaktun, Inde, Nadine, you know, Katalba, you know, Gula, Nahaganse, uh, you know, these various, you know, names, mm -hmm. then what you're doing is, man, being that your body is uh, made up of 75% water, your brain is made up of like 90% water. And everybody knows that water can be programmed. If you don't know that, go look up Dr. Emoto, look him up and look up the experiment he did with water. And writing words on paper or speaking words uh, on, uh, on over water and the shape of how it restructured the water. Even putting a, a writing a word down and taping it on a glass and, and the water inside takes on a structure based on the word. Well, it's the same thing. When you start dealing with these ancient uh, tribal affiliations and, and, and national uh, origins, it's the same thing. You started to influence the water inside you, which has an effect on everything inside you, which has uh, 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 the ability to open up these portals to where your ancestors can come and go freely and give you information. And man, I'm telling you, a lot of those documents, like especially the Kraken, I wasn't even here, bro. Mm. I, I'm serious. I wasn't even here. I was just being, it was almost like automatic writing. Uh, a lot of the various documents that I put together, uh, the uh, commercial struck by the hand, the, the amount of hours I was pushing my body, man, uh, 72 hours with no sleep, you know, and, and still running, still running while I'm researching, you know, most people would have collapsed. You follow what I'm saying? So I already know that that was a power beyond me, you know, as I was putting these things together and, uh, uh, uh you know, furthering, uh, my goal of liberation from this tyrannical system you know, that is way off track in accordance to its organic foundation. So yes, when you, when you, when you say the word more, you are reaching back to the ancient lands of what they call Mu, Lumuria. You're reaching back to uh, Maria, or which is ancient Hindustan. You're reaching back to ancient Kemet. And all, and everybody knows that the Marians was over here. <coughs> Kemet was over here. Tamari was over here. Uh, you even reaching down to uh, the Stargates down in South America, Remu Maru in uh, Peru. Mm -hmm. You can look that up, Remu Maru and the priest king, Amaru Meru, or Amaru Maru, who was the priest king that activated the Stargates down there at the giant walls they have. See, this, 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 this word and, and its phonetics is very old, it's very ancient. So when you start messing with these sounds and frequencies, man, you yourself become a portal by which you can bring this, these various energies, i.e. ancestral energies to you, and you can receive information from them. Right on, bro, man. Yeah, and it, it, it's a fact. You yep. know what I'm I, I, I affirm this, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so yeah. I affirm this.
Uh, yep. bro, I'm just gonna share our, uh, my screen here. All right. Yep. And then, you know, so what we see it's, you know, some landmarks, you know what I'm saying? So yep. that's the one, you know. Yep. You that's know Cahokia. Yeah, yeah, that's Cahokia. Say that again? That's Cahokia. Uh-huh, uh-huh. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, just to show to the people, that's the one, if I'm not mistaken, near uh, where that one is. That's, yeah. that's right. That's down the street from me. That's Toltec. Uh, for real? All right. Yeah. Yeah, okay. that's about probably about uh, 25, maybe 30 minutes uh, going down uh, Highway 70 in North Little Rock. It's in Scott, it's in uh, Scott, Arkansas. Okay. And let me tell you, let me tell you about that one, man. Go ahead. Uh, back in September of uh 2018. Yeah. There was a, there was a sister that was down here with me, man. Uh she had come down and we was we was uh you know talking at the time, dating at the time. I took her out there on her birthday and we was walking the mounds and everything, and we was right out there at Toltec. Brother, listen to me. <laughs> Yo. We both walked up on the mound. We was probably about 30 to maybe 50 yards away. Okay. From one of the mounds. And when we got within that, that boundary, a uh, energy wave blasted off of that mound. And it like it hit us in the head. And I, I almost fell back. Oh, and she almost fell back. And I was like, did you feel that? She said, yeah, I felt it. Did you? I said, yeah. What did it feel like? She said, something came off that mound. And man, the thing was pulsating like it had a heartbeat. Mm. The mound was pulsating like it had a heartbeat. It was like, you could feel it. And we felt it in our eyes. The, whatever the energy was, it hit us right in our eyes. She felt it in her eyes too, and it was pulsating, man. Wow. And yeah. when, so repeat that. When was that again? That was September 2018. I oh. took it out there on her birthday. Oh wow. Yeah. Oh wow. So mm -hmm. you bro, without you know story thinking, uh, please share, you know what I'm saying? The yeah. uh, the uh, mystical, the mystical uh presence behind those you know ancient structure, aka landmarks. Mm -hmm. And what Ronnie Chic Ronnie Bay uh, mm -hmm. has found with the uh, Empress, you know, with yeah. the Empress. so yeah, go ahead and expand on, expand on that, please, man. Yes, uh, every summer solstice, every summer solstice, you can go out to Toltec Mounds, and if you go to my website, I have a picture on there. If you scroll down below the videos. And go to, yeah, keep going all the way down. Okay, keep going, keep going. There you go. Keep going. Keep I'll going keep right going. there. Okay. Right there. Yeah. Every summer solstice, it, perform, it performs that event in the sky. And you look at that, that is the eye on the back of the $1 bill. Mm -hmm. That is the great seal on the back of the $1 bill that performs it, that, that same solar ritual every year for however long those mounds have been out there. So that lets you know that we're at home. Indians don't build things like that. That's high civilization. And that's somebody who knows how to watch the sky. Right. You follow, you follow what I'm saying? And if you are, if you are a sky watcher, then that means that you have to know about how Anubis Caves was formed because every uh, spring equinox in a is performed at Anubis Caves in the panhandle of Oklahoma. Uh -huh. You know, uh, even down at the mounds in, in Louisiana, I want to say Watson Break Mound, uh, a solar a solar event uh, every summer, so every solstice and equinox points, it's, it performs. These are people, man, that have been charting the sky far longer than us. If you look at these people on these reservations, they didn't do that. They didn't do that. But, but if you go to, uh, if you study ancient Chaldea, Elam, and places like that, 
that and, and Hindustan, those people were masters of astronomy. Those people were masters of astronomy and watching the sky and cosmic events and all that type of stuff. And this is what I was saying that a lot of these people, man, from over there, they came over here around about 5,000 years ago, you know? So uh, continue, go ahead yeah. with uh, your, your the landmark. Link, the link with uh, what uh, Ronnie Bay showed to you, you know, when he oh, went yeah. actually to one of these uh, structures. Uh, he uh, basically what he showed me, uh, uh, Elder Sheik Ronnie Johnson Bay, he was with the Empress and he sent me this picture of these quote unquote Negroid heads carved on a flat stone or like clay. And it had a uh, paleo Hebrew, right? It looked like the writing looked like paleo Hebrew, very old, very ancient Hebrew. And these were given to the mother empress. They was given to her by, uh, some people had been digging in mounds and exploring caves. I think these particular ones, I don't, I'm not sure if they came out the mounds or the or Burroughs cave, mm -hmm. but she was sitting there holding them and, and Elder was uh, by, by, by her, Elder Sheik Ronnie Johnson Bay. And yes, she had those ancient artifacts, man. She had those ancient artifacts like that uh, paleo uh, Hebrew writing or paleo Canaanite, proto Canaanite writing on there. Yeah. And in your document, we're gonna, you know, scroll at your document, the Kraken, and you did yeah. mention that, you know, what I'm saying, yeah. you know, yeah, I, yeah, I have, uh, it's put up now, but I do have a picture of it where he, uh, he sent me a copy of that. Mm. So, yeah, so a lot of these things, man, these people already know the, uh, the powers that be, mm -hmm. Europeans, they already know, they already know, they're just, and they know the thing about it is, uh, you know, we'll uh, uh, we can we can go into the pygmy burial site, man. You know, the Negrito pygmy burial site of Eastern Tennessee, forty thousand years ago. These people already know who was here. The thing about it is, being that the land is established or set up in trust, mm -hmm. you know, it's a trust. And how do we know it's a trust? Because once again, you have to go back to uh, the papal bulls. I don't care what anybody says. Do I agree with it? No, I don't. But law governs all events, and you have to deal within the framework of law. Yeah. The Pope, and I want to say maybe the 1200s, there was a papal bull called the Unum Sanctum. Mm -hmm. and the Unum Sanctum, uh, he declared himself vicarious uh, Vicarius Fili Dei, which means Viceroy of the Son of God, or Viceregent. The tr he's the trustee. Uh, he's he's God's trustee on Earth, and he took the entire planet and put it inside that trust. And anyone he said that. Uh, that's not a member of that body. You're basically outside of the trusteeship of quote unquote God. And therefore, man, we have no right to, we, 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 we have no, no uh, uh, duty or obligation to regard you or anything about you, you know? So yeah. if you know trust law, then you have to proceed in the proper manner and fashion as a beneficiary, because once the beneficiary shows up, According to trust law, they have to return everything to the beneficiary. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And so if you are not coming in proper fashion, you know, and the Vatican runs all of this. Vatican, the Vatican, the Vatican was signed over. I mean, excuse me, England was signed over to the Vatican right after the Magna Charta was 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 done. King John, if I'm correct he did a treaty with the Vatican that placed him up underneath that Unum Sanctum. And the United States is a subsidiary of Great Britain. Why? Because the central bank, man, is what they use to conquer the Republic. Yeah. So 
you know, that forms what they call the trifecta. That forms the District of Columbia, the City of London, and the City of Rome. Mm -hmm. And so being that the Unum Sanctum is actually, man, the outline of the trustee, once you come in with the beneficiary, they have to release it. And why? Because if you study the, uh, the papal bulls and the authority by which the Pope writes the papal bulls, he has two sources of, 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 of law that he draws from uh, to draft the papal bull. Yeah. And he drafts it from number one, natural law, and the other one is from the Bible or the Torah. Mm -hmm. And it, that's all throughout there in trust law, you know, Leviticus yeah. 25, 10, everything. But you're not coming, man, uh, <laughs> in the proper fashion. You're not going to get anything. And that's just what it is. Mm -hmm. Sounds good, bro. Okay. And now, uh, just one thing, though. So mm -hmm. going now, what, you know, who's sanguine, so technically right of the blood right oh uh, yeah that deals with uh mm -hmm. the but law of blood that, yeah the law that, of blood yeah but before that you know you in terms of archaeologics you, mm -hmm. you have found you know i'm just going to put uh one an excerpt out of your document kraken mm -hmm. you spoke or you write, you wrote, you know, about, you know, ancient Miramar in, our, in mm -hmm. Argentina, you know what I'm saying? Allendale, South Carolina, you know? Yueyat uh, Laco mm -hmm. uh, in, in Mexico. So mm -hmm. it's like many, you know, archeologic sites, you know what I'm saying? Making the links with ancient people. And mm -hmm. even here uh, from uh, this gentleman, Carlos Cuevo Marquez, you know, mm -hmm. from Estudios Arqueológicos y Etnográficos, uh, Tom One. So he mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, in that page, page 272, that in ancient times, young America was a misnomer black continent and that black tribes such as found in Haiti, Brazil, Panama, Mexico, and other tri black tribes of the North and South American lands are the mm -hmm. remains of the autochthonous misnomer Negro race and so on. And the misnomer red American Indian were subsequently formed. So yeah. now you uh, you put in your work the whole concept with genetics and yeah. right of the blood. So explain mm -hmm. on this, how you came about it and all the steps that you did. Because now we we all see you know the big picture, but behind the scene, I'm pretty sure you know what I'm saying there's tremendous mm -hmm. work hours. You know what I'm saying to properly informed it. So please expand on this, bro. Okay. Well, I first and foremost, I have to thank my teacher who took me under his wing and taught me and showed me how to do the research and due diligence, mm -hmm. which is Tyrone Cannon. Uh, you know, I'll forever be thankful to him. And uh, he was very influential in my studying, you know, of genetics. Yeah. So uh, how I, how I derived at what you're reading there, that that can be none other than the people misnomer today is Negro, Black, color, African American, Afro Latino, all that type stuff. Mm -hmm. Was uh, to go back that far in antiquity. What I looked at was the chromo uh, the uh, the Y chromosome and the mitochondrial DNA. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, and when I started studying those of various groups, uh, first thing I did was I studied the ones of the various reservations that's over here. Okay. And when I went through the uh, timeline of their appearance, uh, because the, mito the mitochondrial and the Y and their offshoots, their derivations have genetic mutational timelines or timelines in biological history when that mutation came about and when it became expressed yeah you know you have in genetics what they call ancestral and derived ancestral can be looked upon as it's there but it's dormant derived can be looked upon as it's expressed in other words uh 
testing has revealed that uh, this is what it is. Yeah. So when I started looking at it from that perspective, I saw that none of these people, man, <laughs> uh, who they're saying are indigenous to the soil could have been back that far in regards to, it matched what uh, Carlos Cuervo Marquez has said with Wailaco. Wailaco from the US Geological Survey, and I have that paper as well, I have that white paper. The US Geological Survey and the University of Pullman, Washington stated that it was roughly 250,000 years old. None of these people, I don't care if you go to Asia, uh, even if you go to the South Pacific with the yep. Negritos, uh, even if you go to Siberia, even if you go to Australia, uh, none of those people have in their mitochondrial and wire makeup the antiquity that goes back that far. They don't. It's not them. They don't have it in their derived states. The okay. only ones who have it in their derived states are those people who have been misnomered as African-American, Af Afro-Latino, Negro, Black, color, yada, 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 yada. You follow what I'm saying? Right. Now, not only that, in its antiquity, uh, it preceded the out of Africa model. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. As far as when they say Homo sapiens sapiens migrated out of Africa. So that already shows that there was a group of people already here 250,000 years ago and even further, you know, I have, uh, I wrote in my documents uh, about what they found down in Argentina, you know, 3.5 yeah. to 5 million years ago, you know, anatomically modern human remains. None of these people go back that far. These mm -hmm. people are in, in comparative analysis of that, they're recent. So the genetic mutational, the, the, gen, the genetic mutations and the biological timeline of the mutations is what allowed me to sync up to show who was there at these places of human activity. Okay. Uh, another thing that uh, allowed me to get deeper into that was the uh, ancestry informative markers from the autosomal DNA. And that dealt with the, uh, the pygmy skulls or the pygmy burial site that they found in Tennessee. Tennessee. And the markers, the anatom, uh, the uh, 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 the uh, ancestry informative markers in the autosomal, which links specifically to those groups of people out of Southeast Asia. We're talking about the original people of Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, North Vietnam, South Vietnam, Malaysia, Philippines, uh, Taiwan, Indonesia, Papua. New Guinea, uh, uh, Cal New Caledonia, Andaman Islands, uh, Melanesia, uh, and even uh, 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 Australia. When I started looking at those markers and I started seeing them pop up, 88% of the time, the people that went through the process we had, these same markers kept coming up. Uh -huh. uh, no, excuse me, 91% of the time. And 88% of the time, the proto-Siberian mongoloid markers kept coming up. And that showed me that, okay, if you are saying that, quote unquote, so-called black people were brought over here about 500 years ago, and uh, we know that what they call slavery, was a highly regulated industry. There is no way in the hell these markers are going to keep showing up with this continuous frequency in these people that you have misnomered these things and given a false history to because it's looking more and more like according to genetic science and according to the archeological constructs over here that show human activity long before you people were even on the planet that what you actually did was, man, you conquered and captured the autochthonous aborigine and fabricated a history with minimal contact 
of what you did so-called bring over here from the continent Alkebulon. You took that whole entire minimal contact and threw it on everyone. You blanketed every, everyone with it. And the DNA kept showing more and more, man, that, that the history was alive, fabricated. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, within that work and, you know, uh, big up to uh, Tyron Cannon. Yeah. You know, uh, it put lights that, you know, companies sort of like, you know, the, mm -hmm. the companies, you know, 23 and me, I forget, uh, name it, ancestry whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, they're only portraying a colorable, you know, I'm saying results, right? Or analysis. Right. right. Uh, you know, so could you take, you know, probably a minute just to share this? Because yes. you can do it. Yes. What he does, because he's been doing it for so long, since like 2009. By the time I found him, it was 2014. What he does, he has different types of, because uh, he, he, he was going to school for that. And the University of Perth, Western Australia, he had, uh, he, what got him into human genetics, he was a championship dog breeder. Yeah. And that's, that's what got him into to, to genetics of humans. You follow what I'm saying? Because he bred championship dogs and he had to know that pedigree. Yeah. You know? And so when he started, uh, he started going to school for human, that's what made him actually go to school for uh, uh, genetics dealing with, with humans. And when he started uh, dealing with the Australian Aborigine and those various people over there, Papua New Guinea and Caledonia, what they call Austronesians, he started hearing some stories. And then he got deeper into the genetics because of some of the stories he's being told, they already knew about America long before the Europeans did. You follow what I'm saying? Those people have been seafaring over there for thousands of years, you know? Yeah. So once he saw the algorithm kept popping up when he was doing his own analysis with people, uh, by the time I hit him, he was already man thorough in the game from going to school as well as doing his own independent uh, genetic research. And uh, the only thing I brought to the game was the descent because I knew law. So I said, okay, not only are these re these 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 uh this information matching up with what my great grandmother my great great grandmother told me, Odessa Yancey and uh Liza Gibson, I said uh there has to be a way to make this functional in law. So I went to Rules of Evidence 702. Sure enough, there it was, and I said okay, I said uh, brother Tyrone, this is I said this is what I need for you to do. Have you ever heard of the descent? He said, no, what is the descent? So I explained it to him. I said, okay, I need you to take the science. Here's the law as it pertains to it, but I need you to take the science, you know, with your own findings and we need to prepare a descent. And I was the first one to get the descent back in 2014. After that, you know, people started coming through this method. Yeah. He started doing descents for them. Yeah. So uh, there's a lot of things, short tandem repeats. Uh, the white papers that uh, are from these peer reviewed bodies of knowledge hold a lot of the clues and keys in regards to us over here. Like, for example, I give you one haplogroup L1C, uh, a third of L1C that's in the genetic database belongs to African Americans. And when they ran it against his counterpart and I'll keep it on, i.e. Africa, few showed any genetic matches whatsoever. And L1C, the genetic mutation on the timeline for that is roughly about 60,000 years ago. So that shows you that if it's not matching up with the L1C or a few matches, if any, in the continent of L1C, that means that it's been separated from its continental counterpart at least 60,000 years. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I just, you know, I'm just highlighting something here out of your mm -hmm. document, and that's mm -hmm. from Anatoly Kraintsov. So mm -hmm. you know, it's only resuming what you're saying, you know, the MD, DNA, you know, yeah. micro groups, L1, mm -hmm. 2, 6, and the right chromosome micro, you know, are not African in origin, and then you go, you know, to expand on it. 
You know what I'm saying? So yeah. that's there's it. another mm-hmm. there's another document that came out in 2017, and I have that one as well. And it goes into the most recent common ancestor between Homo sapiens sapiens <laughs> and uh Homo uh Homo Neanderthalensis, which is Neanderthal. And it was showing that the most recent common ancestor, because here's the crazy part about it, fossil records of uh, Al-Kibulon do not support the presence of Neanderthal. But Asia, uh, uh, Western Asia, Eastern Asia, uh, supports the, uh, a high presence of Neanderthals. But the crazy part about it is the most recent common ancestor between the two groups, Homo sapiens sapiens, Homo sapiens neanderthalensis uh, was showing through uh, molecular biology that it had to lie in Asia. And the reason being is because you can't <laughs> separate two groups that, have, that come from a common ancestor and place their origin in separate place, places. It doesn't right. work. Right. Yeah. So their paradigm, as far as what they've been telling, is falling apart, man. Mm-hmm. Science is destroying it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're right though. And um, I just wanted to share something with all that being said. Let me mm-hmm. check if I can have it. Mm-hmm. If not, it's okay though. Uh, it was a map, an ancient map, you know what I'm saying? That was showing the migration from Lemuria to the uh, South American. Uh, yes. Country, you know what I'm saying? And up to Atlantis. But yeah. anyway. Uh, I'll share it to the people. Oh, I'll probably have it here, bro. So allow me to take probably. Mm-hmm. No, it's okay, though. So you know what? Uh, we'll skip that one. I'm just going to share it to the people. So, hey, bro, before I uh, open up the uh, Q&A, so that's mm-hmm. your webpage here, obashangutl.com. It yes, is a online university, you know what I'm saying? Because uh, within your own drive, uh, if I'm clicking here, so mm-hmm. it's well, you know, structured and it goes to, wow, to, uh, you know, anthropology, language, uh, everything about Norwich, uh, you know, monetaries, uh, the mm-hmm. internet trust, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And trust books as well. So mm-hmm. you click in one of the files, you get like, you know what I'm saying? A lot of documents mm-hmm. and you got stuff too with mystery, mystery school, you know, so. Mm-hmm. It's well, uh, it's heavy on the information, all right? And you know what I'm saying? With your document too, the Kraken, we can be found right there, you know, since mm-hmm. your, your project, Weapons of Mass Call of Law Destruction, all right? Mm-hmm. And uh, hey, bro, uh, yes, what, you know, in the, <laughs> let's say if 30 seconds, I'm going to ask you three questions. Try, uh, yes, let's aim for 30 seconds, you know what I'm saying? So. Quickly, the emperor, mm-hmm. the importance, Empress, the importance yeah. that she had on your life. The empress, uh, you know, beyond finding my connection uh, with with the Washita, uh, she was the first to get people that look like us recognized as the oldest indigenous people uh, of of America, of, of not only America in the world. Yeah. At the uh, at the uh, Geneva, United Nations. Bless and peace upon her. Yeah. Yes. Uh, next one. Prince Uriel Bay on your works. Prince, Prince Uriel Bay was the one who, who actually brought you <coughs> to light the Born Stone, as well as uh, uh, the Moorish Latin and the travels of Hanno, the navigator. Uh, in the ancient uh, proto Canaanite, uh, uh, Paleo Canaanite, uh, Moabite, and, and, and those people from the East coming over here, establishing, setting up kingdoms, which made me look for the writing pretty much all over the place. And it's, it's in Oklahoma, it's in Uruguay, it's everywhere, man, Vermont, New Hampshire. So, you know, he brought the ep- epigraphical evidence to the forefront as yeah. legal documents. What up? That's what up. So now we have, you know, Ascended Masters. Uh, they do operate on the sixth dimension and fifth as well. They also, you know, in the uh, subterranean levels. 
-hmm. So let's say now on the mystic and uh, approach, mm -hmm. uh, Noble Drew Ali, but on the mystic approach. Noble Drew Ali? Yeah. Noble Drew Ali, I would have to say, uh, his focus on spirit with, with uh, time never was when man was not, and that uh, pretty much that the essence of God and man are one. You know, when you see when you see yourself, you see a lot, and how to uh, conquer and master the lower self to develop your higher self to live in the divinity of the Godhead that you were designed to be, mm -hmm. and to study study intensely. Yeah, and study yourself and study uh, DNA. That's what led me. To, his words led me to, to studying yourself. Mm. Noble Dry Oh, that's what, what I, your ancient forefathers were. You are today without doubt or contradiction. So what does that say? Study your blood. Yeah. Study your right. bloodline. And that's deep though, huh? Yeah. That's deep. Yep. <laughs> That's deep though. The blood thing, it's deep, man. So, you know what I'm saying? So let's, uh, Chief, we're gonna open up the Q and A. So I'm just gonna ask uh, the people, just, you know, state your appellation, just so the Chief knows where you came from, just state, you know, which territory you, you are. So whether it's Quebec territory, Ontario territory, all right? So whoever wants to uh, jump in, go ahead. So, you know, you can ask about commerce, uh, trust, uh, genetics, History, even mystery school to the chief, all right? So go ahead, people. Peace. Peace, peace. How you doing? I'm good. You. Um, and my name is Hattie, and um, I'm from Toronto, Ontario. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to ask, um, in terms of the DNA thing, like I know my um, bloodline was Bay. My, my, my name is Bay, my bloodline is Bay, but, but my husband is L, so I was taking on the L. What do you think about the differences and like, if you're married, if you could take on your husband's bloodline, do you think it's, you should just keep the same? And also I was told for the DNA thing, for the, um, um, some people have this reservation, like um, it's not really a good idea to go and get them in your, get them to take the, your blood because they do stuff with your blood. What do you think about that in terms of the DNA thing? Were you born in a hospital? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I mean for the. I know, I know, but like that's what I'm saying. You, you ever been to a dentist? Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> um, um, you know, you've had people that's been incarcerated. You've had people, man, that's uh, been in the military. They already got you. They already got you. They've been. They've been had. If, as a matter of fact. They actually started uh, cataloging the various populations in 1960, 1961 or 1962. And individually, they started taking it in 1975. So if you were anywhere after that, rest assured, they probably already got you. <laughs> so, I mean, people are gonna have their reservations, but I'll say this, Sophia Stewart, she did an interview. I don't know if you know who she is, but She's the lady that wrote The Matrix and The Terminator. And she said something that was so powerful that basically she basically reverberated what I've been saying for years. She said, man, she said, until a, a man knows who he is, you just guessing at who you are. He said, until you do your DNA, you just guessing at who you are. You don't know who you are. That's just like, I didn't know that, you know, I only knew what my great grandmother and my great great grandmother taught me when they took me back as far as they could on who we are and gave me our tradition, history, and lessons. I had no idea that I had uh, Negrito DNA running in my veins. Those are my ancestors buried in Tennessee 40,000 years ago. That's who they were, the Negritos, the little people. And that, that marker shows up 91% of the time in us. That means there was a heavy population. They said there was about 75,000 of those graves they found over there. And they're even finding them now up in Ohio. Mm. So until you know who you are, you're just guessing. Okay. You're just guessing. You know, then people, me, myself, I don't push it down people's throat because I'm good. <laughs> you know, so me, me, me and my crew over here, we're good. You know, it's up to them because what's going to happen is 
he who makes the claim bears the burden of proof. The burden of proof lies on him who affirms, not he who denies. Bouvier's Dictionary of Law, 1856, Maxims of Law. So that boils down to claim and proof of claim. And when you do it, it take, does it take like, how long about how long does it take to get the results? Uh, it takes maybe about three weeks to maybe a month. That's about, I think somewhere up in there, about three weeks to a month, you okay. know. But just go and do your homework on the sites, you know. And they have a, they have a, they have it all laid out. Not only that, they have it where you can, uh, you can actually correspond back and forth them, so you can make an informed decision, you know. Gratitude. Mm hmm. Now, I want to say this because you mentioned something. You said, uh taking on your uh, your husband's bloodline. You can't take on nobody's bloodline. Your bloodline is your bloodline. You know, I think you probably meant uh, uh, taking on his, uh, his, uh, his family name or, or something like that. But your bloodline is your bloodline. Yeah, like, I mean, like, I'm a bae and I found out I'm a bae and he's an L. So I'll mm -hmm. say both names so i was uh, like you know sometimes when you take in canada you take your name your family name and then you add on the yeah the, so that's how it was mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. because it's l or bay and i'm kind of mm -hmm. like between the two mm -hmm. uh that would be something i guess that you guys would have to talk about because uh i know in a lot of indigenous cultures over here when the man would get married, he would move out and move in with his wife's family, you know. Uh, and I know in a lot of the cultures from the East, you know, that's where the taking of the surname came from, you know. So uh, that'd be something y'all have to talk about. I couldn't make a decision on that or point you in one direction or the other. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dean Bay. So uh, whoever wants to go next, go ahead. Hello, hi, uh, my name is Akeem. Peace. Thank you a lot for the knowledge. Um, the, question, the question I have before we start any like uh, trust account or um, commerce account, do we need to go further in the um, um, spirituality? When you talk about dealing with a trust, well, a trust is commerce. Yes. Your, your spirituality is, is that's something that's personal. You know, that's how you commune with the ancestors in the most high. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I can't see where, you know, in the initial stages, uh, one spirituality will play a part on their trust or formulating a trust. Yes. You know, your, your spirituality is your spirituality, man. How you connect is how you connect, you know. A trust is just to protect you when you're doing commerce, uh, dealing with these, these foreign agents on mm -hmm. our soil. So now, uh, if you're talking about certain texts in regards to like the Bible or the Quran, uh, and you're talking about contracting, well, a contract is made up of, first and foremost, you have an offer, you have a meeting of the minds, which creates an acceptance, an agreement, and then you have consideration, which is valuable consideration, which uh, induces the party to contract, and then you have what's called truth. A contract cannot be based in falsehood or fraud. So uh, a contract is formed up of what they call terms, conditions, stipulation, and agreements. And uh, Maxims of law, lex contract fait la loi. The contract makes the law. So whatever you may put in your contract, if it has spiritual terminology, uh, <laughs> then that becomes part of the terms, conditions, stipulations, and agreements. Once the uh, party accepts it, and and all the uh, the uh, points of contract have been met. Thank you for, for the answer. And what about um, the type of, uh, do, you, do we have a currency that we should try to keep more or like in your gold or coins or anything else? Um, I'm a firm believer 
and what the most high has naturally established. Now I will tell you that I have, uh, I've recently purchased some crypto. Uh, I have uh, two Ethereum, but I'm not looking at getting too heavy off into that. And the reason being is because gold and silver was here before we got here. It'll be here long after we gone. And it's in accordance with natural law. Why? Because you can melt it down, you can grind it up, you can turn it into powder. It's still gonna be gold and silver. You know, it's, it's part of the natural frequencies that was spoken forth and created, <coughs> created by the most high. So that's natural. That's something that you can pass down. It, 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 cryptos and things of that nature, right now they have, their value is mostly from derived from its uh its borderless uh ability to be used you know internationally you know it, it knows no borders but the thing about it is it's based on electricity and what if the grid goes down you know what happens to your crypto then so there's a lot of things you know that uh I look at with that you know Although I'm not telling you not to deal with it. I'm just telling you weigh your pros and cons. Uh, me, myself, I, only, I got a few, just two coins. And I'm looking at the aspect of what's been money or what has been circulated as money for the past 5,000 years. Gold and silver have been used to transact business for the last 5,000 years. Indisputable fact. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Akeem. And then again, uh, anyone who wants to ask a question, just mention your position and where you're from at. All right. Hello. Good day. Greetings. How are you doing? <laughs> Thank you for um, helping us. Uh, get our, sorry, I'm driving. So thank you for getting us uh, connected to our ancestors and stuff. So I'm in, I'm in Toronto and um, I came from Trinidad and Tobago. Mm -hmm. uh, my father name is Sam Lau. So he's, he's a like Indian from probably mm -hmm. India. My mom, uh, and her family, it looks like, uh, I think they're from Carib or Arawak mm -hmm. people because they have mm -hmm. like black, they, they look like black native people and stuff. Mm -hmm. And their face is like flat and stuff like that. So yeah, so my mom on my mom family side um, is Montano. So mm -hmm. I like, I'm, I'm just a beginner and I'm learning and um, I don't know if I'm supposed to do my family tree and uh, on my mother's side. And um, I, I was told that as long as it's come from the bloodline mm -hmm. um, that I can continue doing, um, doing my research and follow through with, with what I, what I need to get. Right. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I just, I, I need some like advice, like, you know, about this. Okay. Uh, it sounds pretty much like you answered your own question. <laughs> yeah, but so so um so just do my family tree, my my history, and so so now I, I'm I'm divorced, but I haven't changed my 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 ex husband name, so I'm mm. like Shah, but mm. I do I don't know which name to put like. Uh, I know I have to change my name, my my marriage mm -hmm. name, but mm -hmm. like uh, I I think I, I I don't know if to go with my father's name or if to go with my mother's name, Montano. Uh, if you're correcting your status, uh, you can go with with both, and I'll tell you why I say that because, uh. I kept both uh, my surname 
and I also included my mother's maiden name, her family name, in my entire appellation. And the reason being, the reason why I did that is because, number one, all my documents are filed in the courts. Number two, uh, there's no telling what may happen two to 300 years from now in case my descendants lose their way. So if by chance, you know, or my relatives, you know, who uh, are related to me and their descendants lose their way, if by chance my name is spoken and by chance they find the court records, they will see the name Hervey, which is my father's uh, surname, family name, and they'll see the name Hopes, H-O-P-E-S, which is my mother's uh, maiden name. So they can begin the process of tracing back to who they are from what I left them by looking at those last names. So that's the reason why I did it, you know? So once again, that's entirely up to you. The choice is up to you. You have to yeah. make that decision. I, I can't tell you one way or the other. I can only tell you what I did and why I did it. Yeah, I think it's best to put both names because um, it's, it's just gonna trace back, uh, still gonna trace back to my mother's bloodline. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. So um, I have another question about, so I've been driving for UPS over 16, 17 years and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So when I get mm -hmm. my trust, um, what what should I do in order for them to start? I, I don't know the procedures. Well, first things first, what you have to do before you even get to a trust, you need to have a foundation on which your trust rests. And that means correct your status because if you are a corporate citizen, you can't own any property. You're already spoken for. So the first thing you need to do is set your foundation come out from underneath the corporate structure. And once you do that, then you can start looking at putting together trust and you put them together in accordance with law as it pertains to your status. Right now, I wouldn't worry so much about that. That's like putting the cart before the horse. Okay. All right. Uh, also, another thing is um, I own a house right now. <laughs> so um, it's a lot of things to learn, like, a lot of history stuff we, we, we have mm -hmm. to start you know getting into and and learning more about and you know our rights and and it's very sad that people take take that away from us like um mm -hmm. you know i'm caused by all of this stuff because i'm now learning you know mm -hmm. so yeah and i i feel for people a lot like you know i've been sharing stuff and mm -hmm. um yeah so but thank you so much. And um, yeah, so would you be coming on every Saturday or there's different people coming on? Uh, this was just uh, Amaraki. He had asked me and, uh, you know, of course, he's, I've been knowing him for, for a number of years. So it was just, uh, I guess it was a spur of the, I can't say spur of the moment because we planned it. It was just, you know, just something that happened. So, But I'll probably be back. You know, he had me back. I'll be back. Yeah, well, thank you so much for your help and you're helping people. That's really, really a, a great thing that you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Take care. Thank you, thank you Cecilia. So uh, the chief's website is in the chat. So, you know, I inviting, I'm inviting inviting a lot of people who may not know it to go and check the stuff, you know what I'm saying? Because you're going to relate in a way or in another. You know what I mean? So then again, uh, anyone who's took, okay, so I'm saying uh, tier B is unmuted. So probably you want to go. So tier B just did, you know, your relation and where you come, where you come from. All right. Hi, Toyano. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. I'm in my car. Greetings. How you doing, brother? I'm all right. Thank you for being with us. Um, yes, my, my question is related to our, the way uh, we live or What's the vision? Um, currently, I, I just came about the affirmation last August. And from mm -hmm. what I gather, at the end of the day, 
we kind of have to live together in a community, not uh, everyone, everyone, everyone is scattered everywhere. So That's am true. I correct or you're very it's about you know, to live on our own and to, to be uh, solving mm -hmm. on a little corner mm -hmm. or? No, 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 you're absolutely, you're 100% you're absolutely correct. And I'm gonna tell you why I say that because number one, there's a, there's strength in numbers, number one, you know? And number two, uh, in order to get the maximum benefit from treaties, they have to see you in some type of societal construct. Although you do have, <coughs> excuse me, you do have the right to, uh, to uh, you know, be an individual, but the maximum benefit comes from communities. So I would say that, yes, once they see you coming together as a society, then what happens is uh, you start to form government and structure. Uh, it'll be a lot easier to deal with them because you have to understand, number one, what you're up against. What you're actually up against dealing with these people is, uh, you're dealing with number one, corporate, a corporatocracy. The corporatocracy has taken over the government. The governments have failed. And so they just wear the mask of government. They wear the mask of government, but, and, uh, but they're 100% corporations. So if you don't want to be caught up in that, then you have to start to structure. and set the boundaries in accordance. Can you hear me? Yes, I, I lost it for a second, but I, I, heard, I heard most of the, uh, your answer. Yeah, you have Thank to you. set the boundaries on how you're gonna deal with these people because as an individual, they have the numbers and the thing that they're gonna do is they're gonna use the numbers and they're going to use their size and their stature against you just to railroad you. But when you have numbers and you have charters and you have constitutions, then you have bonds in place and you have your commerce established and you have uh, branches of your indigenous government. Now they know that, OK, we have to take these people seriously. They're literally, man, exercising their right to self-autonomy, you know, and. Uh, uh, they're using international law. These various bodies drafted up. So, you know, it's no more just one individual. We can tell them something and shoo them away like flies. No, that's not going to work. It's not going to work. Okay. So, is there a minimum number, like to say, that they need to be uh, as recognized community? Uh, I know need right to now. And build some, some houses and call yourself a community to be recognized? Well, I would say a good start can be 10 people, families included, that's children. Uh, okay. You know, so if you add your children and you got about 10, 10 adults and everybody's married, that's about, you know, 10 families, that's about, what, 30 people? So that's a good number, you know. So, uh, you know, you just have to, I would say, kind of look at it from the angle of, you know, you got to see who's really willing to do the work. So a lot of people, man, they say they won't, they'll, they'll do the work. And when it comes time to really do it, they're not going to do it. So you have to. You have to weigh the pros and cons of who you're going to try to build a community with as well. Because some people want, you know, they, they want easy pickings and as less work as possible. Yeah, yes, uh, I hear you, I hear you. So let's say uh, we've built a community and when 10 and more people. So now how do we link up with all the other communities? How do we uh, make it official that we're one and the same? That's when you start to have to draft paperwork and you have to let your paperwork proceed. You have to start putting documents in, charters and things of that nature. But 
you got to understand before you can even get to a community, you have to get yourself straight. You know, you just right. don't hop in the community overnight. You know, the way, the way, this is, this is the hierarchy of things. This is the order of things. It goes first, number one, the individual. Then the individual goes to a family. Then the family grows to a clan. Then the clans grow to tribes. Tribes grow to nations. And nations grow to empires. That's the hierarchy. I hear you. I hear you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Terry. Hey, Chief, uh, you mind if we go until 2 o'clock? That's fine. Okay, good. So, uh, thank you, Terry. Hey, I just want to shout out something, though. Uh, we had, you know, in the last session, I see the Duke of Tears. So, probably a lot of people don't know that, but, you know, uh, mm -hmm. the Chief and Asir has been building, but, you know, straight, real building, you know what I'm saying? And... Out of it, Chief, I don't know if it's worth right now because it's still going, but, you know, the, the bank. Yeah. You know, and the autochthonous bank. So mm -hmm. shout out to this. Uh, people just go on um, on the Chief website and you're going to see the work that's, you know, it's been laid, been laid regarding the uh, autochthonous trust and the bank of, uh, what's it called, Chief? So please go ahead. Yeah, Bank Shia Kansu. Morris Freeholder Financial Services and our talked in his trust. And uh, we have the hierarchical structure for that. The one who sits over it, his position is the uh, <coughs> the Grand Vizier. And uh, he's working on the public interface so that we can start to create liquidity. So things like communities and all of that, man, we'll have our own funding. We don't have to go to the uh the uh european to ask for everything will already have it so and uh he's making headway with that it's been a uh, struggle here and there but not too much we already got pretty much majority of the foundation laid mm -hmm. yeah that's what's up yeah so, the game plan yeah, the game ahead. plan is to be 100 percent self-sufficient and independent you know because if you look at Africa, the countries in Africa, uh, they're in a bad way, man. A lot of men in a bad way, making deals with China, you know, and a lot of their leadership has sold them out, you know, cutting deals, you know, with those people who, who no way, shape, form, or fashion can have their best interests at heart. You know, the Chinese are for Chinese. You know, China's all about Chinese and not for anyone else. So <clears throat> the same with the European, you know, when you start making deals with these people, you know, they, that's when things start to go bad. You want to be 100% self-sufficient, independent as much as possible. Thank you, Chief. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm seeing Brent had a question. So Brent, uh, just... Mention to the chief where you're from, or right, so I'm gonna unmute yourself so you could go. Yeah, what's up? What's up, guys? Everybody good? Everybody good? Yeah, greetings. Um, How you doing, brother? Greetings. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Um, we're from Montreal, right? Could we? Could we? Could we set up that that banking service with you guys in Canada here? That's the oh, it stands right now. Uh, I can't say yay or nay. Not at this time. I could definitely say. Nay, because the Grand Vizier hasn't put the last mechanisms in place. Now, how it will work once we get uh, the electronic side down, then I don't see why not. But as it stands right now, no, we don't have the capability yet. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So thank you, Brent. Uh, anyone who wants to ask a question to the chief? Go ahead. I have another I have another question regarding the community on how it's thought of. Okay. So, at your um, yes. Yeah, since probably, you know, uh, beside myself and the chief, there's 21 people. So, I'm okay. going to ask you one question. Yeah, because uh, to let the uh, chance to the other people, you know what I mean? All right. Okay. So, I just want to know um, 
in, in money wise to start a community? Was it a big investment? Do you need a lot or you just started and as you go, you, you built it? Brother, <laughs> once again, you're putting the cart before the horse. Let me ask you this. What is your status? What is your status currently? What are I mean, you a I mean, what is your what is what is your status currently? Are you a Canadian citizen? Well, I set my paperwork to to be uh, to the great seal. I'm winning for it. So that's my current so right now I'm Canadian per se. Do you have any contracts with the corporate Canada? A bunch of them. <laughs> <laughs> so community is the furthest thing from your mind right now. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? You yeah, I'm so, I understand. Before, you're putting the car before the horse. Okay. You know, get your contractual status correct first. Then you can worry about, you know what I'm saying, what it takes to build a community. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chief, because uh, you know what? Uh, you mentioned it a lot of times, and even there's a court stare the scissors, you know, the, yeah. the citizens of the United States, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, you know, that's the trick, you know what I'm saying? So they're all, you know, awards or chattel or name it as we want it. And yeah. the same stuff too with Canada, you know yeah. what I'm saying? So, uh, yeah. People might have a core, that big house, whatsoever, they're not theirs. You know what I'm saying? It's not. Shadow property cannot own property. You know what I'm saying? So that's mm -hmm. the thing about, you know, correcting your status. That's mm -hmm. first and foremost, like you've, you know, you and a bunch of people are sitting, that's quite vital. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So uh, please go ahead. Question. So you, we have Kay. Go ahead, Kay. Hi, I'm Keisha. I'm from Montreal. Um, so we've been doing a lot of research because we're newcomers um, to a lot of the information, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we were approached um, about the Moorish community a while back um, from actually AG, and mm -hmm. then. We kind of put it on hold because mm -hmm. I, I guess my spirit wasn't really feeling. Um, how should I put it? The place where we visited, um, I wasn't feeling it mm -hmm. at the time, right? Mm -hmm. um, for X Y Z reasons. Mm -hmm. um, so now we're doing um, some research, and I just I'm hearing um, on the same topics, different point of views from. Um, a lot of different moors, whether they've been moors for a while or if they're newcomers. So I just mm -hmm. want to hear your take on the titles um, because I'm getting all different answers and I kind of, which is good. I mean, I'm getting from different perspective and avenues, which is, is fantastic. You know, that's how mm -hmm. you make a whole picture at the end of the day, mm -hmm. but I guess when you hear from everybody, then I guess you'll figure out what the real truth is. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to hear your take on how you um, get the title, the Moorish titles. Of Al and Bay? Yes. Uh, those are attributes. You call them titles, but they actually, man, are for attributes. <clears throat> Al's have historically always been uh, dealing with the law, whether it's natural law or whether it's the written law. Bays are governors. The bays are governors. In the 18th and 19th dynasty of Kemet, El uh, and Bay were viziers of the Tamarian Kemetian Empire. And if you look at uh, uh, El, uh, you have to understand that first and foremost, all of the angels were given the attribute of El. Those were the messengers. Those were the ones that carried God's commandments forward to man 
or society here on earth. So his laws can be carried out. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So L's deal with the law, Bay's deal with the governance of the law, the governance dealing with the enforcement of the law within a given society. You have to decide on which one is best for you. L fitted, fitted me because the law came easy to me. You know, I took constitutional law in high school and I had the highest grade, <coughs> grade point average. I had the highest grade point average in the class. I had a 96 GPA in that class. Next uh, score below me was 83. So law came easy to me. Uh, if you're somebody that's good with management, project management, people management, you know, then maybe Bay is suited for you. So you have to look within yourself, look at your own attributes and make that decision on your own. I can't tell you. Okay. So basically um, everyone chooses their own titles or what's the, the terminology you used? Based on your attributes, your attributes. attributes. Don't, choose, don't put something over your head that the shoes are too big to feel. If that's not you, don't, don't wear that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, because I was um, very curious on how you chose, um, whether it's an L, B, um, Ali, or um, I can't remember. Ali is, the, a, uh, the, Ali is on the reserve for Noble Drew Ali. And only yeah, he a, can, yeah. okay. That's a, that's a high title. Okay. So no one can be above him? Is that it or? Um, and, unless you resurrected the empire like he did and brought us back our nationality, that mm -hmm. title is reserved for him. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to add something, okay, like the chief mm -hmm. mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, within the uh, mystic paradigm, uh, sound and vibration are, you know, very important, but there's there's a lot to respect it. So uh, choosing, let's say that, you know, Ali, it comes with a tremendous, uh, tremendous uh, responsibilities, you know what I'm saying? So, yep. So that's why the chief saying that that thing, unless, you know, resurrecting the people, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, but if not, there's gonna be some, you know, I, I, there's gonna be some damage because mm -hmm. yeah, what we can handle is what we can go with. And if it's too much, uh, unfortunately within the natural law, it's gonna damage, you know what I'm saying? So uh, just to add it to it. So what the chief okay. mentioned, yeah. Okay. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, quite welcome. All right, so anyone next? So then again, any uh, question regarding commerce, uh, mystery school, uh, even, you know, uh, law, constitutional law, uh, trust law, or even, you know, uh, past history or indigenous history. So please go, go, go ahead. And just want to mention, there's no dumb question, you know what I'm saying? So we all, all you know, here to, because, uh, you know, it was a calling. So whenever or you feel you want to ask something, there's no dumb question. True indeed. Um, I have a quick question. Um, how, do you, how do you put the house under the trust? Well... Unless you have a title free and clear, you can't convey something that you don't own into trust. It's called a fraudulent conveyance. So unless you have free and clear title, then you won't be able to do that. Now, the thing about it is we, got, we know all mortgages are fraud. So if you did not res reserve your rights, I know Canada deals with the PPSA. You have to go into the commercial uh, laws of Canada and look at the laws pertaining to contract. So what you'll have to do is you're going to have to challenge the validity of the mortgage 
based on the laws of contract. And I know you guys are civil law up there. They deal with civil law. So you have to do it in a manner that conforms to what's acceptable in their court. And you have to challenge it there. But once you're awarded a judgment and it's free and clear, then you can put it in, in trust. Other than that, you can't do that. A lot of people, what they do down here, they'll make these contracts and they'll stop paying the mortgage. And I don't know why they do that. I tell them, man, don't do that. Do not do that. Once fraud is discovered, fraud begins at the moment of discovery. Then what you can do is continue paying your mortgage, but you do it underneath duress and coercion. You reserve your rights from every payment on their forward and you challenge them. You challenge them privately and you challenge them publicly, but you have to stay in honor. The moment you fall into dishonor, they're not trying, the court's not trying to hear anything. So you have to stay in honor, but reserve your rights and you have to challenge them on the fraud privately, then publicly, and then get a declaration to where that, uh, that um, you're released from that obligation, you know, that burden. And then once it's free and clear, then you can transfer it in the trust. You cannot, you cannot transfer encumbered property in the trust, even if it is fraud. You have to remain in honor at all times. So that's the answer, Brent. So thank you, Chief. Uh, so now it's 1.58. So I would ask uh, anyone, so we could probably, depending, uh, we have probably one or two questions. And uh, if you have one, uh, please go ahead. Now's the time, you know what I'm saying? Although we might have the Chief uh, later on, but you know, let's take, uh, let's take the opportunity of uh, that session right here. So in the meantime that someone will unmute, uh, I did receive a few requests for the Zoom link. All right, so uh, I was not looking at the uh, the email uh, between 11 to, to now, oh, actually to half an hour. So for those people that request the Zoom link, just to let you know, this session is recorded. I'm gonna put it on YouTube. So I'm gonna send you the link and I'll send a copy as well uh, to the chief. Attitude. Any question, guys, ladies? No question, but I just want to say thank you, gratitude for the information. Quite well, thank you. All right, so it's two o'clock, so we have to respect it. Chief, I just wanted to show something to the people, so. Uh, you know, that one I know because a lot of people's been probably asking this. I'm just going to share it, Chief. All right, so it won't be long. So sure. it's regarding, you know, mutual funds account attached to the, uh, so hold on, hold on. You're going to see it. Yeah. So two mutual funds account attached to the uh, certificate of live birth, you know, in the uh, social security, attached mm -hmm. it to the Torian mm -hmm. Hervey. Which sounds like your uh, the, the name that your parents gave you, but it's not you. So, uh, right. could you go, you know, just quickly, just an overview, so people could start research on their own, you know, the whole thing regarding this. Mm -hmm. That to be able to do that is getting more and more scarce. Uh, we just had a contact that, uh, for some reason, now uh, he's not picking up. But what that is was uh, 2013, I was able to uh, gain the Q-Sips from uh, my social and uh, the certificate of live birth. And <clears throat> what I did was I wrote uh, Fidelity because that's where uh, the Q-Sips, uh, those instruments were lodged. And I basically let them know, hey man, based upon my investigation, in my research, this is what I found. And uh, here's the QSIMS. You got X amount of days to respond to this because people have been getting wealthy off of a commercial vessel that was attached to, uh, you know, 
my flesh and through a, a legal fiction. And I'm coming back to get that. And when they didn't, then I was able to procure a lien against them. So that's basically what that is right there. And I was able to, if I wanted to, I could actually use those, but I got something else playing that's way bigger than that. <laughs> way bigger than that. And, uh, but yes, everybody is being traded in one of these houses. Fidelity, T. Rowe Price, whoever's out there. But yes, they have monetized and commercialized you. And not only that, you're traded around the world as well. So, but you can't look at any of those things until you get back in proper status. Because as uh, what they call uh, human capital, you are a revenue generating commodity of the corporate nation state. And down in what they call the United States, they have human beings listed under the agriculture code, livestock. And this is where it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, hey, Chief, uh, you know what I'm saying? I know the people likes it and uh, they're really honored to have you here. You know, that session, you know what I'm saying? That, that have to earth, you know what I'm saying? Talking and everything. So, appreciating more. And, uh, you know what I'm saying? Uh, we heard it, you heard it, you know what I'm saying? So, they would want you to come back. So, we'll work on this, you know what I'm saying? For mm -hmm. a session, no doubt, no doubt. You know what I'm saying? Man. I appreciate you having me. Yeah. I enjoy it. <laughs> All right, yeah. Chief. So, you know what I'm saying? It's an honor. It's an honor. Yes, sir, fam. I appreciate you, man. You take care, man, and uh, we'll link soon. Yeah, no problem. So, the people, if you want uh, to give a shout out to the Chief, just on mute, you know what I'm saying? It's informal here. All right. So, thank thanks very much. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're quite welcome. You're quite welcome. Brock. I can't wait for the next session. Mommy. Mommy. Good love, everybody. Ashe. Yes. Yes, Kelani. Ashe. So I put the chief email if you wanted to reach to him. So it's Obashango at msn.com. And you have his website as well, Obashango dot com all right slash uh no obashango.com there yeah that's enough though all right so chief hey rest well you know what i'm saying enjoy your day and we'll link up again i think he's off already yeah he left so thanks a lot to everyone and i'll send you and i'll send you the uh the link all right Thank you. Most right. appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mommy. Mommy. Thank you. Thank you. Mommy.